Hello friends, welcome back to our Go Agile part 4. By the way, somebody asked me about the music videos. Yes, that's correct. I sing and I also host a music series called My Ranjani. If you follow the content, you can view that. If not, just ignore. So coming back to Go Agile, hope you all got a good foundation on what Agile is broadly and how it is different from the traditional waterfall approach. So over the last three or so decades, so many companies exploring these new ways of development, generally referring to as Agile. It resulted in a number of different methods or frameworks and each of those are unique in their own way but have some commonalities to be broadly called agile with that here are some of the new frameworks that got created and since all of them have some common agile approach the term agile has become more of a generic umbrella term and under that a variety of frameworks got evolved even i don't know much about all these frameworks so you don't even need to worry but we will review scrum because that is the most popular and we will also look at Kanban because a couple of people asked me. Uh, though I am not an authority on Kanban, but I will try to cover Kanban in one of the sessions. Whatever limited knowledge I have on Kanban, uh, I'll share. Anyway, so let's very quickly review at least their, uh, some of the definitions of these different frameworks. Kanban is a Japanese term meaning a signboard. Kanban, it's actually two words. It's originally introduced in Toyota company as a visual display for just-in-time manufacturing as a scheduling system. Coming to IT projects, it's basically a pull system where you have all the tickets and you pull tickets one by one based on your capacity and fix issues. So as I said earlier, we will try to do a separate session on Kanban. So DSDM stands for Dynamic Systems Development Method. It is an iterative and incremental approach. These are some of the very commonly used terms throughout Agile, iterative, incremental. So get used to the terms. So coming to DSDM, there is constant customer collaboration built into this model. Back in the day, there used to be a model called rapid application development. Some of you might have heard it. It used to be quite popular at one time, but it had its own weaknesses and a bit inconsistent. So DSDM was developed to bring the discipline into rapid application development. That's how it was born. The FDD stands for feature driven development. Again, FDD is also an incremental approach. The emphasis is on building client valued functionality through repeatable delivery of tangible software. It was first developed at a Singapore bank it evolved into five different processes, develop overall model, build feature list, plan by feature, design by feature, build by feature. So as you can notice, it's mostly revolving around your features, which is nothing but the functionality. We are not going into details because you don't need to learn so many frameworks in the first place. Secondly, even I don't know much about them except one or two, but it's good if you know that such frameworks exist so you can relate to it if someone talks about them. Next is XP. XP stands for extreme programming. Here, the emphasis is on how you can improve the quality of the software and being responsive to changing customer needs. XP is also generally called as uh, pair programming, which means two people will sit together and will jointly be working. While one writes the code, the other uh, then and there reviews the code. So this involves extensive code reviews that's how they bring in very high quality standards. In a way, coding standards are taken to extreme level. That's why it's called extreme programming. Then you have Scrum. So Scrum is another lightweight framework. It is again iterative and uh, incremental and uh, responding to changing requirements and regularly releasing software. Uh, so pretty much they try to package all the agile uh, uh, concepts into Scrum. We will review again uh, Scrum in, uh, in detail later. Then you have Crystal. Crystal is the least heard framework. There is no clear methodology, but the belief is many times the output depends on the size of a team. And depending on the size of the team, the process and workflow changes. So they give different names to different team sizes, like uh, Crystal Clear, Crystal Yellow, Crystal Orange, Crystal Red, and so on. So crystal clear, I think it's teams with less than eight people. Crystal yellow is teams with between 10 and 20 people. Crystal orange is teams with between 20 and 50 people. Crystal red is teams with between 50 and 100 people. So broadly, the crystal model includes uh, seven processes. There's frequent delivery, uh, reflective improvement, osmotic communication. Uh, osmotic communication means uh, it's basically having teams in the same physical space, like it's co-located. That's very important as it allows information to flow between team members as it uh, as if by osmosis. So that is that is how it's uh, the, the, that's how the name osmotic communication. Then you have personal safety. Team members should feel safe to discuss ideas openly without fear of ridicule. 
So there are uh, no right or wrong answers or bad assertions in a crystal team. And then you have focus on work. Team members should know what to work on next and be able to do it. And this requires clear communication and documentation when required. Then number six is access to subject matter experts and users. Team members should be able to get feedback from real users and experts as and when required. Then you have the last one, technical tooling. Development teams, so the belief is that basically the toolings are very important and toolings, by toolings what they mean is things like uh, the automated testing or configuration management or continuous deployment. That means errors and mistakes can be caught quickly without human intervention. So, that's the, so, so it's basically uh, effectively using automation. Okay friends, now that we reviewed uh, Agile broadly and we also looked at different Agile frameworks under the Agile umbrella. Wow, you're all super catching up quite well. So now you know a lot of frameworks. Anyway, so let's imagine you are starting your first Agile project. So what should be your mindset like? What is the preparedness? If you don't want to fail the first project, what is it? No, you should do the right things. Let's quickly look at that. So there are two aspects to it. One, mostly organizational related things like what kind of projects you can choose and all that stuff. And the second is individually as a person, what kind of preparedness you should have, what kind of mindset you should have. So let's see first uh, from an organizational perspective. I know this is not in your hands. It's dictated more by what the organization tells or what the committees decide. But if you have any influence, you should make some of these points and influence the decision to choose the right kind of project to make sure you don't fail. So let's see. First one, dependencies. So when you choose a project as your first project to try out Agile, make sure that the project has least number of dependencies. See, you know, once uh, a project has uh, lesser uh, dependencies on other factors, it's fairly easy to execute that. So you choose that to try out Agile because you, you don't want to show that your first project has failed, right? It's very important. Perceptions are important. So you want to show a win. Then change management. This is a very interesting topic and very important too. Because unless there is right attitude, it just can't be successful because they will constantly pulling you down. It's like crab culture. You know what crab culture is? So in those uh, freight trains earlier when they have to ship these crabs, they just don't put a lid on the top. You know why? Because if one crab tries to crawl up, two crabs pull it down. So people are like that. It's, so it's very important that you choose right team who are open-minded who have the zeal to try out new things to be part of your first pilot project. So change management is very important. And then open communication. A big difference from traditional methods is that Agile encourages very open communication. So this again is mindset and attitude, but team spirit is very important. There is nothing like one person does well or one does bad. Either you all collectively win or you all collectively lose. And then of course the right team. Uh, by right team, I mean to make sure you, you try to get the right combination of people with all necessary skills. Uh, you don't want to just pull like three people just because they worked with you in the past, though you need some, some other skill. So it has to be cross-functional. Just make sure you, uh, you address the cross-functional needs as to what is required exactly for the project to be a success. So be open to accept other people from other groups or new people, but your emphasis should be to have the right cross-functional combination of skills to make sure the project is a success. And then uh, this is another interesting thing like uh, what is the urgency? Like for example, there are some projects where there is, uh, there is a lot of urgency and, and that helps you a lot because once you choose a project that, is, uh, that, that has a lot of urgency, then you get a lot of management support, you get a lot of support from other departments uh, to make sure this project is successful. So it's very important. So, so also see, okay, which projects have that kind of urgency, that burning desire that, okay, this project needs to be executed quickly or, or some sort of uh, urgency to, to deliver the project. Okay. So these are some of the organizational aspects. Uh, uh, as a leader, you have to make some effort to influence, to make sure that you pick the right project, right team, right environment for your first agile project to be a success. Now, in terms of what your mindset should be as an individual, okay, there, there are certain characteristics that, that are highly encouraged and essential for an agile project to win. So one, take responsibility. So days are gone that there is a project manager and he or she will take care. Uh, why should I worry? Well, that's all over. Now the entire team should feel the same amount of responsibility and accountability. You, also, you, you should also be receptive to hearing suggestions and coexisting with others. Transparency. This is a tough ask. 
the weakness many humans have is not to be transparent. You have to break that barrier. Initially, it is tough, but once you come out of it, it makes your life a lot easier and you will be liked a lot by others. So full transparency is required for you to see a successful project. Team needs to be very transparent and it starts right with you. Don't give up. Life is not easy and smooth. It's like a roller coaster ride. There are going to be ups and downs. You are trying something new. Have a positive attitude. Things will work out. Give a serious try. Things may fail. That's okay. But don't give up. Find solutions. We know in teams, people always try to find faults or problems, which is not a big deal. But finding a solution, yes, it's a big deal. So try, try as much as possible to find solutions within your boundaries. And never say, I'm not here to solve all problems. Of course, we know that. Rather, you say, I will put all my effort to solve the problems. Again, that attitude is very important. Okay, friends, with that, we conclude this uh, Go Agile part four. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, we'll meet again soon in Go Agile 5. Take care. Bye. Hello friends, hope you are doing well. Welcome back to part 5 of the Go Agile series. So in the last part, we reviewed Agile Umbrella and the different frameworks that are generally categorized under the Agile Umbrella. Just wanted to clarify, it's just not limited to those frameworks we saw, but it's just a representation of some of the Agile frameworks. So Kanban was one such framework we looked as part of the Go Agile 4. Now in this session, we will review Kanban in a more detailed way. Reason I'm doing this first is because after this, we will look at Scrum and then from there, we can proceed further beyond Scrum, which will be logical. You will be surprised that Kanban has a rich history associated to it. Back in 16th or 17th century in Japan, after a lot of troubles and conflicts, Japan started seeing some stability and economic growth. As it started growing, the streets of Japanese towns started getting crowded with shops and small businesses. So a lot of competition started. Shops were trying to attract customers and that's where they started using these signboards. That signboard in Japanese is nothing but called Kanban. Kan means sign and ban means a board. Interesting, right? As it picked up, then they started improvising these boards with what they offer, what products they have, their specialties and so on. Some even started designer Kanbans. Like if someone has a music shop, put a musical instrument shaped board. If someone sells fish, put a fish shaped signboard and so on. So many type of these uh, signboards started appearing in the market, but all these had one thing in common. They were able to communicate the offering or product or service very clearly and concisely. Now fast forward, in 1940s, Toyota, the car manufacturer is not like what it is today. They were in losses, struggling to compete with American cars and a bit lost in the market. They had a young and dynamic engineer by name Taichi Ono. He started to bring a lot of changes. One thing he started socializing is that in normal production routine, there are so many things we do which are not required and he started calling it waste. He came up with seven ways, which are overproduction, inventory, delay or waiting time, overprocessing, transportation, unnecessary motion and defects in the product. So let's review quickly each one of these. Overproduction. He says demands keep changing. So what's the point in producing more than what they can handle at a given time? And it also has chain effect. So producing more than what is required is a waste. Inventory. Carrying surplus raw materials is a waste. His idea is keep only just the right quantities at that given time. His idea is produce what is just needed and only when it's needed. So this ensured that stocks are carried at the minimum while making sure a smooth flow of work is established. So sometime in 50s, Tai Chi wanted to find out what is that they are doing different in the US and made a visit. But in his visit, he observed something interesting in a grocery store. He was very impressed by how they are able to keep the shelves stocked up with just the right amount of each product. When the items are about to finish in a bin, they place some yellow colored or, or some card to indicate that the stock is likely to get over and which is like heads up. Accordingly, they order more inventory and at the end of the bin, they keep some red card or something to indicate that it's completely over. So he, he used the same concepts back in uh, Toyota. And number three is delay. Waiting or time spent in a queue with no value being added is also a waste. So in production line, there are many instances where the supplies line up in queue to be used and that serves no purpose. 
because you need them only when you use them. That idling time is a waste. Next is overprocessing. So undertaking non-value added activity. Process are ineffective and time is wasted when one process waits to begin while another finishes. Instead, the flow of operations should be smooth and continuous and probably parallel. According to some estimates, as much as 99% of a product's time in manufacture is actually spent in waiting. The next is transportation. So he thinks transportation also is a waste. Moving a product between manufacturing process adds no value. It's expensive and can cause damage or product deterioration. These are things like, for example, you dump the uh, stuff at one place and then from there you move to another place and uh, finally you bring to some other place where it's actually used in the production line. Then unnecessary motion. Resources are wasted when workers have to bend, reach or walk distances to do their jobs. Imagine a worker needs a particular type of wrench for a certain task. Now, if he has to walk for few meters because it's in the shelf there, that is an unnecessary waste of energy. Rather, if he kept the tool to his, in, in his pocket or something, he can avoid that extra movement. Defects in the product is another waste. The more you spend in inspecting the product for defects, it takes more time and costs money. He used all these seven ways and came up with a new system based on Kanban. He did many things as part of it, like he introduced paper cards for signaling and tracking the demand in the factory. And it revolutionized the entire production system at Toyota that the company almost rose from operating losses to a profitable global competitor. That is the famous Toyota production system based on Kanban. And Taichi Ono became to be known as father of the Toyota production system. So far, we looked at the birth of Kanban and how it got adopted at Toyota production system. Next, we need to see how this Kanban found its way into IT. So over time, the Toyota production system gained a lot of popularity globally. And so project managers all across started trying it in different flavors. But the biggest breakthrough came in software industry and how it happened and what's that story, we will see in the next session of Go Agile part six. Till then, do good, wash your hands and stay safe. See ya. friends welcome back to go agile 6 so last time we started kanban where we looked at the birth of kanban and how it got adopted at toyota production system so today we will look at how kanban found its way into it and how it became one of the popular agile frameworks so over time the toyota production system gained a lot of popularity globally and so project managers all over the world started trying it in different flavors but the biggest breakthrough came in software industry so from 2001 onwards, there were active discussions around Agile, Agile Manifesto and so on, which we reviewed in the previous uh, episodes, right? So around 2005, one gentleman by name David Anderson took Toichi Ono's production system and started applying it in the IT process and came up with Kanban for IT. Predominantly, he called it the pull process. He came up with six principles for Kanban in IT. Visual workflow, limit work in progress, managing the flow, make the process pulses explicit, implement feedback loops and improve collaboratively. If you observe carefully, few things are becoming prominent in the system. Those are batch size, flow, queue, work in progress. Now let's try to understand these principles with some examples. There are two burger shops here. One is a ready to go burger shop and the other is a custom burger shop. In the ready to go shop, what they're doing is based on historic analysis, they figured a particular type of burger is most popular. Hey, these are just some examples, okay, to help you understand the underlying concept. So don't get into debates that uh, there are McDonald's sells so many types of burgers, or Burger King sells uh, uh, so many different types of burgers and so on. We are not building a case study on burgers here. We are just evaluating some examples to understand the Kanban concepts. Okay, coming back. In the ready to go shop, they studied that certain types of burgers are popular and also analyzed that they get lots of people at certain time let's say 12 to 1 p.m. So what they do is they will create a number of those burgers and keep them ready just in time by 12. So people walk in, pick a burger, pay and go. So it's very efficient and faster. So they know, so they know in the 12 noon batch, let me make 50 burgers. In 1 p.m. batch, let me make 30 burgers. So the batch size is very crucial here. That determines overall delays, efficiencies and, and even costs. Coming to the right side, custom burger. Now a customer walks in, picks and chooses whatever toppings or sides that he or she prefers. So as the customer orders, someone is literally fixing the burger. 
So it's one customer at a time. There's no concept of some 20 customers picking up and walking away. You see the difference, right? So moral of this is how a batch production and right size of batch boosts your productivity and reduces costs. Now let's look at the flow and capacity. Again, don't get confused. I'm just using the terms as per my convenience, but capacity again can relate to your batch size. Imagine there's a bridge. At any given time, there cannot be more than 100 vehicles on the bridge. That means that is the maximum capacity of the bridge. But technically, you can fit in 200 cars at the same time on the bridge. But just because you can fit in 200 cars if you allow so many to continuously go, then what happens? It can be chaos, traffic mess, delays, accidents, and bridge can even collapse, right? So never maintain at full capacity. You won't have a smooth flow. Agree? Same thing in IT. When you overload a member, it can have many side effects. There's one gentleman, Don Reinertsen, who is the author of a book called The Principles of Product Development Flow. And he quotes in the book, operating a product development process near full utilization is an economic disaster. So what do you do? You try to control the flow. How do you control? One method is you introduce a system of issuing cards uh, to each car that enters the bridge on both sides. Let's call them the North toll gate and South toll gate. Let's say you maintain 100 cards at North. So on North, when cars enter, you issue a card. When they exit at South gate, they are supposed to return the card at that gate. So the South gate operator uses the same cards to issue to cars entering on the South side. And those cards are collected back at North gate when they exit. So by this, what you're trying to do is you're maintaining a steady flow. So it always stays within your limits of 100 cars. That's what we refer to as limiting the workflow. And you can also visualize the workflow with the number of cards that are in your bin. Just take it as an example, okay? So we are just using it to understand our concepts of Kanban. Excellent. Now let's study the queue system. Imagine there's a coffee shop and there are customers walking in to order coffee. Now, when more and more people come in, what happens? The queue becomes longer. If queue becomes longer, what does it translate to? It directly translates to delays in the whole process increases the wait time, quality of coffee could be compromised, there could be some spills here and there, wrong orders can be processed, and the person making it could be demotivated. So many things can happen. So what he's saying is in IT projects, you try to reduce the wait times. So a professor by name John Little developed a formula to measure the average wait time, which is you take the average queue length and divide it by average processing time. Don't worry too much to understand the formula and how it applies uh, for now. But generally, you just keep in mind longer queues are not good. It leads to longer wait times. It's funny, little law deals with long queues. So it makes it easy to remember, right? So the next is making process policies explicit. So what he means is there could be policies uh, established, but unless you explicitly communicate, sometimes it's not of much use. Just to look at an example here, the traffic policies exist but either they are not communicated properly or not understood. And that can lead to chaos and even accidents, right? That's what you see in the picture. Now, if the same policies are explicitly communicated and made to understand, then the flow gets smoother. That's what we do with uh, traffic cops or traffic lights, right? So that is what the right side picture is. Okay, the next is implementing feedback loops. So feedback loops are a vital part of Kanban. We use feedback loops to tell us if the things we do are effective or, or, uh, or is it making an impact. These feedback loops can be done through a set of meetings with different cadences. You focus mainly on how you're getting things done, how can you do it better, and how you're doing the right things. So there are seven different uh, meetings that Kanban uses uh, for feedback loops. As you can see, it's uh, highlighted with those circles in red. So we don't need to go into details right now because we are not covering Kanban in uh, full detail. But this is just to give you an idea as to how many places or how many instances that you can get feedback. Okay, nice. Typically in Kanban, there's no estimation. It is continuous or ongoing tasks, no time box iterations. There are daily meetings, but focus mainly on the impediments. So the focus is going to be just on delivery based on capacity rather than overloading the developers. If you imagine the number of issues or tickets or tasks that you need to complete, they'll be put into an indefinite pipeline, which, which in agile world, we normally call it uh, backlog. So there's a single indefinite backlog and developers pull the tickets from the backlog and process them. The backlog of items can always be prioritized or reprioritized. So if you see the board in each area, such as input analysis, development, etc., you are pulling only the limited number of tickets from the previous bucket and working on them. How many are you pulling? 
you are pulling only what you can handle based on your team capacity. If you see the number 6432 on the top, that shows your team capacity in each bucket. So accordingly, you will pull only those number of items from previous buckets. So it's a pull system. Clear, right? So basically you are pulling. It is very evident that Kanban is a good fit for maintenance or service type of projects because it all runs by issues or tickets. You drop the tickets in an indefinite backlog. You can prioritize and put them in some order. Then team pulls the number of tickets they can handle and every group pulls from the previous bucket and it goes on. So that is Kanban in IT. So before concluding, let's look at some of the benefits from using Kanban. Number one, simplicity. By far, this is the least invasive agile framework to my knowledge. Fairly simple, flexible, and easy to execute. You don't need a lot of transition or knowledge compared to some of the other frameworks. In fact, I used this uh, in one of the instances uh, some time back and results were amazing for what we were doing at that time. Shorter lead time. Cycle time is a key metric for Kanban teams. Cycle time is the amount of time it takes for a unit of work to travel through the team's workflow from the moment work starts to the moment it ships. By optimizing the cycle time, the team can confidently forecast the delivery of future work. And also overlapping skill sets also helps to uh, shorten the lead times. You, you're getting a cross-functional skill set. For instance, testing isn't done only by QA engineers. Developers pitch in too. In a Kanban framework, it's the entire team's responsibility to ensure work is moving smoothly through the process. And then focus on priority items. A Kanban team is only focused on the work that's actively in progress. Once the team completes a work item, they plug the next work item off the top of the backlog. Visibility. The Kanban board is pretty straightforward. You know exactly which task is where and it provides a lot of visibility. Continuous delivery is the practice of releasing work to customers frequently. Kanban and CD beautifully complement each other because uh, both techniques focus on the just-in-time delivery of value. The faster a team can deliver innovation to market, the more competitive their product will be in the marketplace. And Kanban teams focus just precisely on that, optimizing the flow of delivery to customers. Then reduction of waste. You are focusing just on the essential items rather than working on some unwanted tasks. To the point, so wastage is minimized. The Kanban method seeks to achieve balance between customer demands and business capabilities. This balance between these two is what determines how stable your IT organization is. Many times when you lose this balance, that is when you see overworked workforce, uh, productivity going low or uh, quality going low, uh, delivery is getting delayed and so on. So Kanban model helps to get that balance. So with that, we conclude uh, Kanban. Uh, I hope you liked it. I thought this will give a good overview of uh, the whole Kanban system. If you are interested further, you can always uh, get some advanced training in Kanban. And with that, we also conclude this Go Agile 6. We'll meet again soon in Go Agile 7. Till then, stay safe and see you. Friends, welcome back to this Go Agile series part 7. Last time we reviewed Kanban which is one of the Agile frameworks. Today we will review Scrum which is another popular Agile framework. So what is Scrum? In a previous episode we talked about the Scrum Age in the rugby game, uh, the new new product development by Hirotaka and Ikujiro. You remember right? So in early 90s, two gentlemen, Ken Schwaber and uh, Jeff Sutherland, they built a software development approach taking some of the original new new product development principles of Hirotoko and Ikujiro and they started calling it Scrum. So in 2001, Agile Manifesto came and then slowly Scrum started becoming more and more popular. Scrum is again a lightweight framework which gives a lot of flexibility. At the same time, it's not too light like Kanban and so it became almost the number one Agile framework in the last decade. So in short, Scrum is an agile framework for developing, delivering and sustaining complex products. So initially it was more focused in the software development, but then uh, it expanded beyond software development and went into research, sales, marketing and advanced technologies. I want to give a heads up that I am not following the standard bookish type of format for Scrum. I am changing it slightly because I feel this is a bit easier to understand uh, Scrum. So please bear with me, but we'll try to cover most of it over a few episodes. In Scrum, Broadly, there are four things we need to study or understand. One, Scrum roles. Two, Scrum ceremonies. Three, Scrum artifacts. And four, Scrum values. That completes the Scrum. Scrum roles is basically we are talking of what are the different characters, people, you know, who involve in Scrum. The Scrum ceremonies is nothing but 
uh, the meetings, all those different meetings that happen in a typical uh, sprint. And then you have Scrum artifacts is the tangible deliverables, uh, what we expect in a Scrum. And then you have Scrum values. So to summarize in Scrum, there are three roles, four ceremonies, four artifacts and four values. I don't think we can cover all this in one session. So let's break it up and distribute across multiple sessions. Now let's begin with the Scrum roles and what do they do? Scrum team. There's a major shift from traditional approach in Scrum. In traditional model, there's a PM or project manager who is very powerful and there's a lot of authority. The team just follows the instructions. No questions asked. There could be hierarchy also within the team. In fact, the team many times don't even know what they're really building and why they're doing and what is the business stake and what is the business impact and so on. I'm saying on average, sometimes some members could be carrying higher responsibility and some lower and there's dependency on few members who knows much more and deeper about the project than others. When it comes to Scrum, entire team owns it. Everyone is expected to know everything. They know the expectations, they know the vision, they know the impact, they know the risks. In short, they're very self-organized. So no spoon feeding. Nobody is going to call them for meetings. Nobody is going to remind them what tasks they need to complete. Uh, they just need to be very attentive and responsible for all of their actions. They collectively take the system forward. They all have equal responsibility. Clear, right? So in short, they are no longer managed, but they are self-organized. Now let's see the different roles of a typical Scrum team. You know, earlier in projects, we used to call project manager, business analyst, developers, testers, and so on, right? Now in Scrum team, it's fairly simple. There are only three types of roles. One is product owner, one is Scrum master, and then you have the developers. That's it. So let's uh, review each one of them. Let's start with the Scrum master. The Scrum master knows all the rules of the game. They closely monitor any impediments. Impediments are nothing but blockers. Now to remove these impediments, you may have to coordinate with other teams, other departments like legal, finance, admin, etc. And someone has to coordinate with release management also external business stakeholders. All this is handled by scrum masters. They are like the spokesperson for the team. Then they will facilitate any meetings required within the team or, uh, or with other teams as required. Don't forget teams should handle their duties by themselves though. Scrum master is only a facilitator and in other words called as servant master. They work to protect the team, make sure team has no impediments and work is moving smoothly. It doesn't mean Scrum Master is responsible, right? The entire team is responsible and they should follow all the requirements and expectations. There's no compromise. Then let's see the product owner. A product owner is responsible to gather all the business requirements. So it's their responsibility to coordinate with business stakeholders or product managers, and they have to make sure that they are aligned with enterprise-wide business objectives and requirements and know the exact business value of why a certain feature is being developed or necessary. They should prioritize the requirements. They maintain the backlog and so on. Backlog is nothing but again, the complete list of all requirements that you keep adding and it's an indefinite long list of items. So when team starts working on the development, PO or product owner should provide all guidance and answer any questions related to what the team is building. And the third role is developers. Of course, they are responsible to actually build the product. They should be clear about the requirements, understand it well, should be able to quickly do the necessary breakdown of stories into tasks and so on. As we continue, we are using number of new terms such as features, stories, tasks, product managers and so on. So we will discuss all of them again. So don't worry much about it right now. Nobody tells the developers to attend meetings in time or to keep moving the tasks, ensure all stories are completed before the sprint ends. They should be very self-organized. If a scrum master is repeatedly pinging them to join daily standups or sprint planning sessions, etc., that means they're not doing their work effectively. Coaching can happen only up to a certain extent, but it can be babysitting. There's a difference. So we saw the scrum roles. Next, we will see what are these scrum ceremonies. Scrum has four ceremonies. Basically, these are nothing but meetings. First time when you start learning, people think this is some big technical term and there's a definition and you got to understand nothing like that. It's just a set of meetings that we call scrum ceremonies. There are four such meetings and collectively we call them scrum ceremonies. Now, what are these four scrum ceremonies? One, daily stand up or we also call it DSU. Daily, when you start the day, you begin with just a short 15 minute meeting. What do you do here? Each member shares what they have done uh, so far, or which is probably yesterday. And since you are meeting daily, so they convey what they have done yesterday, then convey what they are planning to do today. 
and then discuss if they are stuck with any bottlenecks which we call impediments simple right i see in many places they run these meetings for 30 40 minutes and sometimes even an hour but that's not an effective or efficient way once you run these for a month and get used to the scrum ways you should not need more than 15 minutes and if there are some pointed discussions about an impediment or or something else they should have an offline meeting after the daily stand up but invariably they engage all members for that 40 minutes or so which you should avoid and teams should have the self discipline to make sure they join these meetings in time there's a wrong notion that scrum master has to start this daily stand up every day no that's wrong whether scrum master is there or not the team should be responsible enough to start the dsu at the right time sprint planning you will start every iteration with a planning session it will be once in a sprint so daily stand up is daily whereas sprint planning is once in a sprint a sprint is roughly 2 weeks a sprint planning is a bit more detailed where the team goes through the backlog of stories the product owner will be prioritizing the stories and will say okay these seven stories for example are top priority they should be done in the sprint then team goes through each of these seven stories and try to understand the scope ask any questions get clarifications by the product owner and then the team will do some sort of estimation of each story let's spend a minute on what these stories are your stories are nothing but short simple descriptions of a feature told from the perspective of the person who desires the new capability that's normally a user or customer on the in the system generally a simple template is followed so you are building the software for some user or business right just imagine if they explain how they visualize the functionality is nothing but your user story that's why we call user stories but more generally we also call stories so product owners should be well versed with writing user stories in such a way how a business visualizes and also something the team can easily follow and of course the product owner is there to answer any questions or clarifications if team has there are four key elements of a sprint planning ceremony define the scope of the sprint uh basically you will determine which tasks in the project backlog your team intends to tackle during the particular sprint that are available to work on them and and assess your team's current work capacity uh, that means you are you are factoring all the holidays events or days off so every member should upfront inform if they are taking any offs or if any leaves in that during the sprint so accordingly the scrum master can do some sort of capacity planning then set goals for the sprint establish when these tasks are expected to be completed in your scrum schedule what constitutes completion and any other metrics for success you deem necessary there is something called definition of done that means teams should plan to make sure all stories meet the done criteria to close them before the sprint ends and and uh, we will will be reviewing many of these things again like the done criteria and all that stuff so don't worry right now for now just imagine like let's focus on this this ceremonies right now then address concerns open the floor up to your team to discuss any roadblocks issues or potential scheduling issues that might affect the delivery of any backlog items so to a large extent this is what you do in a typical sprint planning meeting so sprint planning meetings are slightly longer they can go from 2 to 4 hours uh, for each sprint but then during the sprint planning the team should also be able to break down the stories each story into tasks and we'll cover that in detail maybe later so next we'll go to sprint review that's the third ceremony so just like we begin a sprint with sprint planning we also hold a sprint review at the end of the sprint what we do here is we review the work product whatever was developed so far meaning we will inspect the increment and make sure the product is meeting the expectations we invite business stakeholders also to be present at this meeting they provide any feedback and any improvements so we can adapt to those as we move on to next sprint and we adjust the backlog also accordingly so during sprint review if any new changes are suggested or if any were suggested to be dropped then product owner will note down and accordingly adjust the product backlog so in the next sprint when you go for sprint planning you are you you have the right stories to proceed further and here we are not reviewing some documentation in this print review but it's more of demonstrating the actual tangible product that's been developed so far and the last uh, scrum ceremony is the scrum retrospective scrum retrospective is the scenario where the scrum members come together to do an appraisal of their work it's a self inspection on how they are executing their tasks things like what went right what went wrong Uh, what can be improved what needs to be stopped uh, and so these sort of things will be discussed and it will help the team to become more productive as they move forward so those are the four scrum ceremonies so now we 
we completed scrum roles and then we completed scrum ceremonies okay i think this is good for your first session of scrum there are so many other things to cover and we will try to catch up with uh, some of the other stuff in the upcoming sessions so with that we'll conclude this go agile 7 and till we meet again in go agile 8 keep practicing agile stay safe and do good see you